The hostile sea can also be, for some people, a protection. Several communities from South America, hiding from the sea's currents, have used it to reclaim their freedom. In Honduras, the Garifunas were slaves on the run who managed to escape their fate by settling on isolated shores. They fish, grow crops, follow the beliefs of their African ancestors, and structure their life around a single rule, to do what they please. The Kunas from Panama have fought for their independence in the past. Nowadays, they are their own community, sheltered from others by the sea. In Colombia, the Apalanche Indians live in an arid and remote land they escape by dreaming. And finally, the Jangadiros in Brazil have built their identity based on their love of sailing. Using their Jangada, they venture away from the shores to fish and enjoy the ocean that makes them free men and women. The sea created us, say the Garifunas. These descendants of slaves live today in tightly knit communities along the coast in Honduras, away from the world and its noise. With one foot in the sea and the other one on the ground, the Garifunas have never forgotten their African roots. The day begins at dawn for Garifuna sailors. Edito is 52 years old, a well-respected captain. He's always been a fisherman, and the ocean holds no secrets for him. We have to be careful during the launch. It's not something to be done lightly. The waves can be treacherous here. It can make the process difficult. We need to locate a series of three waves and wait for the right time. Once the wave barrier has been crossed, there's no need to head to the open sea to find fish. It's enough to navigate along the coast. Be vigilant. The sandy floor rapidly becomes deep here, and the cold currents running along the shore attract shoals of fish that swim just a couple of dozen meters away from the beach. The history of the Garifunas begins in the Caribbean, on St. Vincent Island. Survivors from several shipwrecks carrying black slaves blended with the Arawak Indians living on the island. They were then hunted by the English and ended up on the coast of Honduras just over 200 years ago. Today, they are a people in their own right in Latin America. Shall we go over there? No, better over here. If we want to catch something, we need a big perimeter. Fish are smart, they keep moving. In order to see them moving near the surface, we need to keep an eye everywhere. People on the beach help us by screaming and pointing at the fish. Everyone here is able to locate the tiniest movement on the surface. We all know how to read the sea. Can you see anything? Keep an eye on the birds. What about over there? What are you doing? There are too many of you. The fish are going to escape. Go help them. See, we got them. The 
the way back after fishing is always a special moment. The catch is divided among fishermen before being sold to the members of the community. All right, we can begin the distribution. We're seven sailors, so that's seven shares. Once we've shared, we'll sell what's left. Punta Piedra is a village of almost 2,000 inhabitants lost on a wild coast. 400 families live here without running water or electricity. They're all Garifunas. Garifuna, a word that means cassava eater. Behind the village, the foothills of the American mountain range are like another ocean, a series of waves and steep hills covered with tropical vegetation. Women such as Celsa, Edito's wife, are responsible for taming this wild land. A land that was terra nullis, a land of no one, before the Garifunas settled here. Yes, a 20 minute climb every day, just like our fathers and mothers before us and our children after us. If we stop working the land, the jungle comes back very quickly. Fifteen years ago, there used to be a plot here. Now the forest is back. Living near the jungle is a constant struggle. This is hard labor indeed. What a plight! Every day we have to fight against weeds. Removing weeds, cutting, planting, again and again. So real sacrifice, really is. Without cassava, there can't be garifunas. Cassava is just as important as the fish men catch in the sea. No single individual owns land around here. Instead, the community distributes plots to each family. The community owns the deeds for all of our lands, for the vast territory around us. People interested in building hotels and making palm oil would like to get their hands on our land. We have to fight constantly in order to preserve the boundaries of our country. We won't let them get our land. This is Garifuna land. We were born here and we'll die here. We'll never leave. This is our home. At the height of the day, the heat is stifling. Punta Piedra falls into a deep slumber. It's not until the end of the day that a breeze from the sea finally starts blowing, an opportunity to go fishing on the beach. We like to come and catch crabs at the end of the day. Just us, the women and the kids. After the day's heat and work, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. 
Machuca is our traditional soup. It's based on coconut milk and banana puree. This one has crayfish in it, but regular fish also works. We use the richness of our land and combine everything it gives us when cooking. I want to say machuca is a strong symbol of the Garifuna culture. It's the result of a mix, just like us. It's like our language. It blends African, French and Arawak words. It's a bond that connects us with each other. We're proud of it. One for all and all for one, that's how it works here. There are no distinctions between us. When we go fishing, we leave together and we come back together. We're neither rich nor poor. But thanks to God, that's enough for us. We're all descendants of slaves that never became slaves. And that is in our blood. Edito goes out to sea again. He moves away from the shore for another kind of fishing. You think it's full? I hope so. It's quite heavy. This one's nice. Every day at sea or on dry land, the Garifunas fight to maintain their most precious legacy, to survive and to stay free. Through the years and despite some wandering, they managed to remain within Hispanic America. Garifunas are from here, but also from over there, from Africa on the other side of the Atlantic. Africa that is so far away, and yet unites them. The journey continues south. We leave the Garifunas behind to go to meet the Kunas, a people from Panama who have fought to remain independent. Four hundred years ago, the Kuna Indians left the mountains in the north of Colombia to escape from the conquistadors. A string of islands in the Caribbean Sea became their refuge. A people of the land who became a people of the sea in order to preserve their lifestyle and culture. Kuna Yala, the land of the Kunas. It spreads over 200 kilometers along the Panama Isthmus, a territory made of a wide strip of land located at the foothills of the Darien Mountains, along with an archipelago of 400 coral islets sheltering the villages. To move between islands, the Kunas use ulus, four to five meter long pirogues sculpted from one trunk of hard wood. Ulus aren't equipped with a rudder or keel. Their sails are a patchwork of old pieces of fabric held together with a simple sprit. This is the way to El Tigre. That's where Leo, his wife and his daughter live. 
a tiny island two days away by boat from the nearest road. This is one of the 38 inhabited islands in the San Blas archipelago. Isolated and protected by the ocean and the mountains, the people of El Tigre have managed to preserve their lifestyle and identity. Any newcomer to the island must first pay a visit to the Saila, the village's traditional chief. A long time ago, our ancestors used to live in the mountains. When the conquistadors came, they had to run away. Then they discovered these islands, but there was no food or water. Bugadup, the one who created the world as it is, told them they could settle down here and he'd give them everything they needed to live. Whenever we fish and bring back a lot of fish, we have to share it with the community. Nobody owns the sea. It is the wealth of all Kunas. The people of El Tigre only have to open their door when they want to fish. Sheltered from the wind, between the island and the continent, the lagoon's warm water is full of fish. A simple nylon thread and a hook are enough to catch what's needed to survive. It still demands some skill, though. When the bait is at the bottom, the fish comes closer to eat. We listen and we'll feel it. One, two, three, and you pull. This is the method my grandfather taught me. This one has a beautiful color. We call it Yaladela in Kuna. It's very nourishing. There are plenty of different ones, big ones, small ones. This one is small because it lives in the reef. There's something white over there. This is the coral reef. It's a protection. It's like a wall. There are lots of waves around here. That's where the fishermen go because it's full of fish, crayfish and octopus. People from El Tigre wouldn't be able to survive without the continent near them, however. Every day, crossing the swamps, men, women and children head towards dry land. That's where they get fresh water, grow vegetables and fruit, hunt game and cut wood. The huge forest seems to eat up the boat. This is one of Central America's last primeval forests. The Kunas call it Boniganas, the spirit sanctuary. Oh, disculpe, te amé. This plant will protect us from evil spirits. People of El Tigre use slash and burn agriculture. Plots of forest are cleared before being burnt in order to fertilize the ground. It allows them to produce rice, bananas, yam, and especially cassava, which is the basis of the Kuna's diet. Once we've removed everything, we replant small pieces. We all replant like this, so we don't end up without cassava. I don't take much since it's only for myself. Tomorrow other people from the village will come. It's important to replant. We're from the land. But we've learned to live with the sea since we can't stay here because of the danger. 
There are mosquitoes, bees, grass snakes, crocodiles. That's why it's better to live on the island. But we still have to head back to dry land, to the motherland, to gather food. Cassava, mangoes, coconuts. The nature around us is a part of us. The island is best for living, but dry land is necessary. God gave us all of this. Today, the village's streets are flooded. The storm during the night has swamped the island. El Tigre is barely above sea level, and the beaches offer no protection against the waves. In order to protect themselves, the inhabitants try to slow down the erosion of the island by planting trees. Today, after 74 years in this world, I've seen a lot of changes. The most important is the rise of the level of the ocean. When the tidal range is high, the village is completely flooded. We never had that before. The islands are disappearing, quite simply. Look at this coconut tree. It is about to fall. There are no more roots. The waves nibble at the land and the roots. In a short while, the tree will fall. There's an island facing precisely the same erosion problem. You could almost see it shrinking. It used to be big. It'll disappear one day, that's for sure. The islands located away from the shore are the most endangered ones. Most of them are uninhabited, but still play an important economic role. Every Kuna family owns land on these islets covered with coconut trees. For many of them, growing and selling coconuts is the only way to make money. This is my camp, the family's camp. I used to live in Panama. I worked there for eight years. But one day, I decided to come back to my village. Because while I was working, I kept thinking about my village. I always kept it in my heart. It's different in Panama. At seven in the morning, your boss tells you to come to work. I felt as if I was in prison. As if I had no freedom. It's different here. We can come to the island, fish, pick up coconuts. You wake up whenever you want. You're free here. Thanks to the numerous islands that shelter them from the ocean, the Kunas have kept their independence. They live in an isolated and protected location that they try to preserve, because they know that if it ever disappeared, their people would disappear with it. The journey in Central America continues. After Panama, the next stop is in a nearby country, Colombia, and its 50 million inhabitants. In the north, the Apalanche Indians live on a rough and dry land, swept by violent winds and burnt by the sun. The sea is necessary to their survival, but its resources are becoming scarce and endanger their existence. They are fishermen, shepherds and farmers. But rain is rare, and so to attract it, they organize dances and rituals following the traditions of a people living balance between two worlds. Es 
Careful, this one is aggressive. It's quite dangerous. This is the spine. It goes inside the skin and it's impossible to remove it. Pepe is 52 years old and a skilled fisherman. Every morning, he brings up his nets as the sun rises. He belongs to the Wayu Indians community, a community of about 685,000 people living in a desert near the border with Venezuela. The Apalanches, which means people of the beach, are Wayus living along the coastline. A couple of hundred Apalanches settled down in the Bay of Portete in the northeast of Colombia, including Pepe. This is my house. Pepe's house is located near a little harbor protected by a maze of mangrove and looks over the bay. It's open to nature and sees a constant flow of children, cousins and friends of the family. He can feed this little community with the fish he catches. The fishing hasn't been great, so today's catch will only serve to feed my family and the members of my community. There's not enough to sell. But whenever I catch eight or ten kilos of fish, then I sell them. This is our main means of survival. In a way, it's our daily bread for our children and extended family members. Without fish, we couldn't live here. The Guajira Peninsula is a desert swept by strong daily winds. It's constantly crushed by the sun and forgotten by the rain, as if it refused to bathe the land. A life of precarious balance, with goats supplying some meat to go with the fish, and also milk and wool. Lina is Pepe's wife. When her husband is out fishing, she sits in front of her loom to weave the hammocks and the bags the family uses. Women are extremely important in this community. They are the ones who own the land. Lina owns dozens of hectares around her house that are used to feed the family's goats. As the afternoon draws to a close, Pepe gathers his flock in a pen to protect them from stray dogs, like a good shepherd. This one needs to feed. As far as I'm concerned, I don't want to give up on the customs that are part of our Amerindian identity. Initially, we were wandering shepherds, not fishermen. We discovered the sea quite late in our history, so now we do both shepherding and fishing. Apalanches are able to fish and breed goats. That's what it means to be Apalanche. A Wayu legend says they were born in the mountains of Venezuela some 7,000 years ago. Apalanches have always been isolated, living with what little they could get from the sea and their flocks. They've never been colonized and continue to this day to feel special. We only speak Spanish when necessary. For instance, when someone from the outside is visiting. But our language is Wayunaiki. It's important to speak our language because I don't want our culture to disappear. I want our children in the future to make it their own, to defend it, to have it in their blood, in their veins. I want them to fight for their indigenous identity.
Sleeping is important for us, since the night is the time of dreams. The meaning of dreams is a key element of our culture. Dreams foretell the future. Thanks to them, we come in contact with our ancestors' spirits. Through important dreams, our ancestors warn us about major events that will impact us or our community as a whole. In a land of heat and dust, rain is precious and salutary, and it never comes unannounced. It comes through dreams, can be seen in the clouds and foretold in the shape of the waves. The signs announcing rain are deciphered during meetings that take place in a house on top of this hill. It belongs to the one leading the community, the one called the authority. Everyone meets there, young and old, men and women. They all come to listen to the tale of the most recent and important dreams. I had a dream two days ago. The sun had just come up. The sea was calm. I was on the beach in Putete when the sea suddenly drew back. Then I saw two horsemen dressed in white, riding fast on the sand. Their clothes were dazzling, like pure white. And I was very impressed by the speed of their horses. They were riding really fast. This is very clear indeed. This kind of dream is easily explained. It means rain will come. The speed of the horses means it'll come soon. To face the threats of this life balanced between two worlds, the Appalanches rely on help from the gods. In order to attract their benevolence, they regularly honor them through a special dance called Yona. It's performed on the spot Pepe is preparing. Yona is announced thanks to drums that invite people from nearby villages to join in. Afterwards, girls receive makeup to honor Polowi, the sea goddess. They use a mushroom-based paint to draw fish and shells on their face. While men tune their drums for the coming celebration. Little by little, the sun sets and gives way to the lights of motorcycles used as makeshift spotlights. This dance is always eagerly awaited. The woman has to run so that the man falls. She goes forward with her head down in order to push her partner off balance. She's the one leading the movement. The man can only react to her attacks by going backwards skillfully. But he must never lose his balance and fall in front of her. That's what Yona symbolizes. If he doesn't pay attention while walking backwards, he'll fall. We also use this dance to call out the rain. Yona is an offering to the gods in order to attract their benevolence and also so they send rain regularly. We decipher our dreams and then summon the rain through this dance. These are the steps we must follow to bring this precious rain. The next morning, rain hasn't come. But Pepe thinks it'll happen within a couple of days. The rainy season from September to December will start. Pepe can see it through small signs that never lie. The water level is high. The temperature is stuffy. These are signs of major rainfall. Am I right? Correct.
The landscape is changing. It's already much less dry, and in three days, everything will be different. Everything will bloom, cactuses will bloom, there will be fruit. When it rains, we catch lots of fish, because they come out of the mangroves and look for food in the depth of the bay. For us, it's time to take out the nets. Once the rain is over, the men get ready to go to sea on the little beach of Portete. Years ago, it was beautiful here. You just threw out a net and you caught a lot of fish. You went out to fish and there was plenty of crayfish. But there's much less now. Life is tough, but I don't want to forget my culture or not hand it down to my children. Because I think it's beautiful here and we should defend this place. The boats take away the shepherds, who become sailors. They'll look for the fish they need to survive between desert and ocean. They go out on a sea that feeds their family, along with their imagination and their dreams. The journey continues east, leaving behind Colombia and its sea shepherds. The destination is the northeast of Brazil, an immense region known for its light, long, sandy beaches. Lining a coast swept by the wind, fishermen of the Brazilian Nordeste have learned to face the sea with a curious boat. They venture out into the open sea to catch the fish they need. But these fishermen are also born competitors. More than anything, they love to test their navigating skills during regattas that reward the best sailor in the village. Take the boom and bring it here. Luis is 21 years old, and already he has a lot of experience at sea. Take the wedges. He's a fisherman, just like his father and grandfather before him. And every day he jumps on board a jangada, a boat typical of this part of the coast in Brazil, that can be translated as raft. The jangada is what we're best at. It's sturdy, solid, well-designed. The jangada offers the best safety. We always try to improve it by making it thinner and thinner so it stays as close as possible to the sea. Strong, constant winds sweep the coast. The sea here is difficult and often dangerous. Those venturing out must have a good knowledge of sailing. And more than anything, they must be able to maneuver the jangadas. These slender boats particularly effective at navigating across waves. The ones able to do so are called jangadeiros. They live in the northeast of Brazil. Luis lives in Canto Verde, a small village of a thousand people with a large community of fishermen. This upgraded windsurf board is, quite unexpectedly, a very efficient skiff. The jangada goes as far as the fisherman dares. It can be 15, 16, 20 kilometers. A good jangadeiro knows where the fish are. He's capable of locating them. If you're not capable of doing that, or you don't know how to sail, then you can't catch anything. Nothing at all. You have to know the sea, to recognize the marks on the surface. That way you know where to throw your nets. When you know all this, then you're a good jangadeiro. 
When the sun sets behind the dunes, most Jangadiros from Canto Verde head back home. They bring back to their family the fish they have caught. This is my house. I live here with my family, my father and my three brothers. Adriana, Luis's mother, is in charge of the house. Ivan, his 52-year-old father, is a renowned fisherman. He's a commander, or master, as the ones able to lead crews during several days of fishing are called here. Lewis is 21 years old and already married and a father. He shares his parents' house with his wife and children, but hopes one day to be able to be independent. I'd like to become a commander, so that I could sail as much as possible. But I need enough knowledge and experience to gain the trust of those I sail with. I think I can make it, but I must be determined and move forward. That's the price to pay to become a boatmaster. I must teach him correctly so that he does everything right and doesn't hurt himself or have an accident. It's all about trust. He must be able to count on his knowledge and I must be able to count on him. And all of this takes time, of course. We have to move on carefully. An example, when we sail in the evening and there's no GPS, I must teach him how to read the stars. And so during the night we look at them together to know when to jump on board and where to go. If I don't properly share my knowledge with him, such as everything I know about the location of the stars and their light cycles, the consequences for him and his crew could be dire. If he's unable to get his bearings, it's easy for him to get lost at sea, which can be very dangerous. The northeast of Brazil is poor. Ivan's family survives thanks to what little money they manage to get from the sea. Trophies won during the regattas are often the only decorations in a house. They're displayed in an obvious way so that everyone can quickly estimate the worth of the sailor living here. The culture of these fishermen places great respect and esteem on the winners of such competitions between Jangadiros. We have the same blood. He has the same willpower as me. He wants to win, to be honored by his friends, just like me. I've given him this passion. I trained him so he'd want to win the races. Such competitions oppose the best fishermen and brighten up the life of the coastal villages, a life of work and routines. Little by little, boats and crew members gather on the beach, getting ready for the regatta that is about to start. The choice of the sail and the method to adjust the rigging are well-kept secrets that will make a difference for the best fishermen. Friends and advisors busy themselves around the boats. Every family has a champion they hope will win the race. That's a lot of pressure for Lewis, which affects his mood. All of this must be fixed better. Look here, it's not even straight. 
This is not serious work, really. A few seconds before the race begins, the boats are placed on the starting line. Luis has one of the best spots. Ivan, on the other hand, is a bit to one side and has little hope of an easy victory. Lewis's boat takes a good position right from the start. But the race is long, almost two hours. The contestants must sail twice around the buoys with a black flag. The wind has a speed of 20 to 25 knots and the crews must control their speed and turn as close to the buoys as possible to avoid losing ground. Luis is stressed because of the regatta. He knows that his father, me, is one of the best champions among the jangaderos, and he wants to be better than me. He wants to show me that he deserves to be a commander because he makes the right choices. He doesn't want to fail. But despite a good start, Luis makes a mistake. On the last lap, he turns too far away from the boy. Another contestant catches up and overtakes him. He's now 50 meters away from the leader. He'll finish the race second, a couple of minutes after the winner. Thus conceding to his opponent the joy of a victory he very much hoped for. You did it all wrong. You went too far away from the buoy and the other guy overtook you. You should have stayed much closer to it. You turned way too late. Well, it'll be for next time. We're already preparing the next regatta. They'll be very skilled people. It'll take place in two months. Second place is a bitter result for someone who had dreamed of becoming a champion, just like his father. But he also knows that he's only 21 and that the future lies ahead. Luis is one of the village's best sailors and probably one of the next masters. He'll have other opportunities to show off his skills to everyone. On the beach, Ivan is preparing the evening meal. He knows that his son Louis will assume command of a boat in a couple of years, despite not winning this last regatta. A bit further away, a group of musicians is rehearsing their capoeira movements, the famous Brazilian martial art. The beach of Canto Verde is shared by every villager. I gave him the strength of character and the will to fight. I'm convinced he'll be a good boatmaster. In my heart, I can feel something beautiful. I feel a lot of pride. It's a great pleasure to see my son becoming a true sailor, just like me. My wife is very proud of him too, and we won't stop here. I have another younger son. I'm already teaching him the knowledge necessary to navigate, just like I did with Luis before. And so all of my sons will be able to defend our fishing tradition and become great boatmasters. That's what I wish with all my heart. As is often the case in Brazil, rain shows up suddenly. 
a bit like all these unexpected events that turn these people's destinies upside down. This journey to America has been an opportunity to share the pride of Pepe, Edito, Leo, and all the others. The pride of having succeeded in preserving their community's identity while asserting their independence. Yet they all feel like they live on the edge, as if being Apalenchi, Garifuna, Kuna, or Jangadiros was a fragile privilege amidst the changes taking place in the world. Mm -hmm.